you are in Vibrant Company, and I'm so happy you're here. Hi, everybody. This is your host, Noni Odom. Today's in Vibrant Company interview is a very special one. As someone that got married in my late 30s and has a lot of girlfriends around that age, I know the silent tug of war of desiring motherhood, but not wanting to settle for a bad mate just to make it happen. There's so much confusion about fertility, biological clocks, timelines, egg freezing, etc. And as time marches on, you must be wondering what choices you have left. My guest today is a woman named Katie Bryan. She is the department head at a very large public school district in Texas. And years ago, she decided to stop wondering and waiting and to pursue solo motherhood on her own. She now has a toddler and is planning her next baby. In our interview, Katie is refreshingly frank about her fears, the financial implications, judgment and support of others, choosing a sperm donor, what she told her colleagues, what she tells her son, and so much more. If you're considering solo motherhood, or just want to understand what your choices may be, you cannot miss this interview. Katie runs a website called singlegreatestchoice.com. She has a podcast and a coaching business to help support and provide community to other women who are pursuing single motherhood. This interview should leave you feeling empowered and with the tools to go about achieving your motherhood dreams, whether you've found the right partner or not. Without further delay, here's our interview. Hi, Katie. It's so good of you to join me today on In Vibrant Company. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited about this. I'm so excited too. I've been following you for a few years. We've talked uh, once or twice about potentially doing this. And I'm actually so happy to catch you now that you've done it and you've been able to reflect and you probably have so much to share and to teach others about your journey, right? Yes. Not just my journey, but having just kind of expanded into supporting other women doing this, I've heard tons and tons of stories. So mm-hmm. um, it's gone beyond just my own experience and, and just really getting embedded into the community of women who are single mothers by choice. And it's been mind blowing. It was not at all what I expected. So yeah. I'm happy to share all of the things. So I love it. Hit, so hit me with all your questions. Let's do it. So, you know, I said, I said to you over email, I always thought that I knew for certain I wanted to be a mother one day. And I knew that if things didn't work out for me, I love how you wrote about your experience in the sense that you're dating, you are meeting so many people, time is ticking by, and you haven't met the right one. And why you didn't feel that you should keep this thing that was so important to you on hold while you were sort of on your love search, on your partnership search. And you went ahead and did something that really mattered to you without waiting. And I I love that message. I know so many women who are at that point where they're asking themselves this question, do I have to wait? What do I do? Do I Mm -hmm. freeze eggs? Do I keep going? So I would really love to learn a bit about your journey, um, how you arrived at that decision, what doubts you had and what kind of support you felt, any judgment, et cetera. Sure. Yeah. I think even beyond feeling like I was like going to stop waiting, what I realized was even if I met a man today that I could see that future with. I'd been in enough relationships Mm -hmm. to know there wasn't enough runway left due to my age. So it wasn't like, I'm going to stop waiting. It was like, I, I, even if I, even if I meet someone, I'm not going to have a baby in a year um, or six months or even, you know, even two years felt really fast and being 37, 38, 39, it was like, you know, I don't have the time. I, I just logistically ran out of runway to make this happen. And so for me, the choice was really about, I'm not going to settle for many years. It was, I'm not going to lower the bar um, and and settle for a guy that is, you know, good enough to pop out some babies. And then, you know, the relationship likely wouldn't last, but then it became, I'm not going to compromise my potential lifelong happiness by gambling on like, even if this guy seems great, I mean, I could have met Mr. Right. And I kind of sort of did right there at the last minute, met someone that I really clicked with, but I just realized I don't have enough time to figure out for sure if this is a person I want to do this baby thing with. I I don't think, I don't think I have the bandwidth to like stick with this long enough, you know? So I just um, needed to, it started with freezing my eggs. And you mentioned that earlier. Um, I was in a relationship and decided to freeze my eggs. And I had been told a number that would be kind of like a good number to land on for my age, um, which was, you know, 20 to 25 eggs for one live birth. And I got seven eggs. And at the time that felt devastating. Now that I've heard many women's stories, that actually was a really great outcome. I didn't feel like it was great. Was that one round of IVF that you got? That was one round um, of egg freezing while I was in a relationship. 
And I just, I didn't have great information. I didn't have a great doctor mm. Mm. and I, I didn't feel the sense of security that, that led to more like panic than, than a sense of like, okay, now I've got those, that security, you know, yeah. um, backup plan. So I ended the relationship. I mean, I mean, to be fair, the, the relationship kind of imploded because of all of the fertility, like it was okay. not necessarily my decision to end it, but I just couldn't continue because of all of the fertility stress. Okay. Um, and awesome. so I moved forward with um, trying to conceive on my own. I was absolutely not ready, but it just felt like it's now or never. Um, and so th that's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about working with women who are in that place because I didn't understand truly how, how fertility worked, how my mm -hmm. body worked, what my options were, what it meant that I had gotten seven eggs. I thought that was terrible. It was mm -hmm. actually, you know, oh, we didn't know there's not, you can't tell much about how, what seven eggs means. You really have to have more information. So, um, anyway, it just led to this long rabbit hole of, um, discovery that ultimately led to me becoming a mother on my own, but not for, I think another like year and a half. It took a, there was a lot between. Yeah. And I, I'd love to, I think a lot of women watching this can learn so much about what they're thinking and hearing how you went from this moment of seven eggs to the year and a half later. When you said you didn't feel like you had a good doctor, did you change doctors and then feel like you started getting I better I did eventually. Yeah. Yeah, I did eventually. So what no one told me beforehand or even after that first retrieval is that many, if not most women who are just banking eggs for the future need multiple rounds. So I, it was a huge deal for me to get together the money to do it once. Yeah. And I thought that was going to buy me the security. And so what I heard on the other side of that is now you've invested, I think it was like 12, $13,000. Uh -huh. And that's, that's maybe half of what you need, but maybe not even, maybe you need three rounds. Like, but even at that time, no one said to me, do you want to do another round? The doctor was just sort of like, yeah, that's not enough. And I, I don't know why it didn't occur to me to do another round. I think just mm -hmm. financially, it was probably not something that I was prepared to do at the time. Right. But as a woman who was in a relatively new relationship, I was just like, I don't have time to, to see where this goes. We got to end this and I've got to start trying to get pregnant. And that's what I did within, I think we ended that relationship in January of 2019. And I was doing IUIs with donor sperm by March. Ah. And I was devastated. I mean, every single month I would just pray that it didn't work when I went through that IUI cycle because I knew I really wasn't ready to be a mother on my own. And also I was so terrified that I was going to miss the boat that I couldn't skip the trying. Yeah. So I was like in a very messed up place wait, emotionally. <laughs> sorry. Wait, let's back up for a second. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Go wait, ahead. We went from wanting to freeze eggs to IUI. Yes. That's a big leap. It I think I missed something. Leap. In the three months, you made that change where you were like, I don't even want yes. to bank eggs. I want to go straight into Like, how did you come to that decision? Is that once again, the timeline or knowing that embryos are more? It, it yeah. was the, do the doctor. Like, I just didn't have the information. Okay. I didn't know I should do another round of egg freezing. I, I didn't see. know that I could make embryos and not transfer them. Right. I, I also had a lot of... Um, kind of money mindset work that I hadn't done yet at that time. Okay. This was 2018 and I'd done a lot of like personal development and stuff, but money was still something that I was like, I just had a lot of stories about how I was never going to have enough. And I didn't have access to a lot of things that I honestly could have probably made work. Um, but at the time it just felt out of reach to do another round Okay, and no one was even really suggesting that. To me. So you felt like the information you got was, okay, the, you got seven eggs in the process of trying to freeze eggs. Let's not do that. Go straight to IUI. And you didn't feel like you were walked through all of the options before even arriving right. at IUI. Right. I see. Okay. Right. What I would advise my, my 2018 self, 2019 self would be to do another round of egg freezing and fertilize all or half of those to kind of get an idea of my egg quality and to not try to get pregnant immediately because I really wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. And thank goodness thank God it, it didn't work. I, yes. I tried to get pregnant for six cycles and it didn't work. And that's exactly what I needed. I needed to not get pregnant in that time because I still had a lot of growth in terms of my own uh, just personal development, but also just my understanding of my options and what yeah. it was that I was doing. Because ultimately I want to have two children. Mm -hmm. And if any of those IUI cycles had worked, I would have been pregnant at 38, 39, 
with no, I mean, I would have had those seven eggs frozen, but I didn't know yet of their quality. Right. And so I would have felt just as much pressure to, to get going on having that second child. Cause I really didn't, didn't know that you could plan. Yes. Oh, so you've touched on something else. I think that the more people are talking about this, women are learning about and they hear this. And I would have loved to hear your perspective on a lot of people know that egg freezing is an option. They get there and then they learn that it's better to freeze embryos, that they have a longer, mm-hmm. a ch- better chance of, um, of taking and you can test them for yes. all sorts of yes. uh, potential maladies. And so also I want to understand if you had to do it over again, do you feel that that rush that you felt at 37 and 38 was justified? Like now with everything that you know about fertility, because I think that we get a lot of confusing information. Like you said in your, right. in your website, you hear that Halle Berry had a baby at 47. So what's the big deal? But then you also hear at 35, you're like getting too old. So now that you've been through all of it, do you still feel like at 37, 38, that was a time to like really go full head into this? Or do you think that a woman at that age could still wait a little longer? I think it's impossible to know. Yeah. I think, you know, we can look at the statistics and try to make them mean something about our own bodies, but we just really have no idea. Yeah. And so I think, you know, if, if what you can do is freeze your eggs, like absolutely do that, do as many rounds as you can logistically financially make happen. If you're, if you feel ready to like, if you're close enough to maybe choosing um, to pursue solo motherhood and you can fertilize some of your eggs, it just gives you really good information about your egg quality because I'll just kind of fast forward a little bit into, I did end up doing another round of egg freezing almost a year. It was almost exactly a year later. I did another round and this time I knew I was going to fertilize the eggs right away. Um, with donor sperm. And when I talked with my doctor about kind of just the cost analysis of like how to do all of the different things, she was like, I really think depending on how many eggs we get that we should, um, th- I had moved to a much better doctor at this point, yeah. but we should, we should defrost those original eggs and put them all like literally put all your eggs in one basket because I had seven from that original round and two of those did not thaw appropriately. So I had five and then I had got another seven. So that was only 12 total. And statistically I maybe was going to get one good embryo, but probably not out of 12 eggs. Cause at this point I was 38, 39. So we, we did that and moved forward. And what we learned was I have really good egg quality or I did at that age. I had poor, you know, low, lower quantity maybe than other women my age. Um, but high quality. So I ended up with five high quality embryos, Mm -hmm. which was far more than enough. Like Mm -hmm. I don't ever want to have five kids, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So then that gave me really good information to then take another step. And I did a third egg retrieval round after that and didn't fertilize those eggs. So that created a scenario where when I was ready, I could transfer an embryo that was donor created with donor sperm and become a single mother by choice. And I didn't, I didn't feel rushed about that. It it was about seven months between creating those embryos and actually getting pregnant. I got to get pregnant when I was ready emotionally, financially. And I have four more embryos that are full biological siblings to my son when I'm ready to have a second child. That's fine. And I did that step of get it, you know, doing another egg retrieval. Now that I'm a solo mom and I love it, I'm like, I, there's a 0% chance I'm using those eggs. Like, I don't want some dude in the mix. Like, I'm so happy to do this on my own. Uh, relationship will come after I'm done building my family. But um, but I have that. If I met Mr. Perfect tomorrow, I could have a baby with him, even if I was 45, 46. Like, I've, I've left that door open by freezing that additional round of eggs. The and eggs, okay. I can feel... Yeah. And I can feel good about the quality of those eggs because I actually I have 12 eggs frozen and I had fertilized 12 eggs. And those two retrievals were only months apart, um, the second and third retrievals. So I feel certain that if I wanted to utilize those eggs later in life, that I would probably get at least one good embryo. And, and you're saying that the when you made the embryos and you saw how many good ones you got, it's informed you that the future eggs that you, you took out were healthy ones yes. likely and it, to be. It sucks that we have to put like numbers to this, Listen. but I thought the investment of going through all of this, putting my body through this and my finances through this a third time is worth it because now I have information about the quality. Yes. If, if nothing had come of the two previous retrievals, if that had been, you know, if I'd gotten no embryos or one embryo or whatever, like maybe you I would, would have had know. different thoughts and would have looked at egg donor or, you know, something like that. Um, but, but it just, I I think fertilizing the eggs is the best thing that you can do to know the egg quality. It's the only thing you can really do to know your egg quality. Absolutely. And yet you may not be ready to, that means you have to choose sperm and that's a huge deal, right? So that's my next question. (laughs) Yeah. How did you go about researching 
sperm donation? Mm -hmm. Um, There are multiple large banks, um, and I did end up going with one of the major banks. There are pros and cons. There are a few smaller banks that are a little bit, just run a little bit differently, um, but there's not as much selection. There's more of a wait. There's, it's just, it's really unfortunate that there really aren't avenues available. It kind of, it feels like Amazon, like you can shop other places, but like at the end of the day, you're going to have to order some shit from Amazon because sorry, I don't know if I can pass on here, but uh, yeah, you know what I mean? Like there's just no avoiding. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I, I first started with the idea of a known donor and I talked to a, actually I was planning to talk to a good friend and then he brought it up. And so he was open, but the more we talked about it, the more I was like, I don't, I feel like that's going to be emotionally confusing for me. Mm -hmm. Um, not so much that I would like fall in love with him because I knew we had actually met on a dating app and then just become friends. And I knew I wasn't like attracted to him, but I thought resentment would creep in because it would feel like he should be helping. <laughs> Part of what I love about being a solo mom is that uh, I have a hundred percent responsibility and zero percent resentment. And that just works really well for me. Um, so I ultimately decided against that. There was a little bit of conversation with the guy I had been dating. And then we like, we were no longer dating at this point, but we were like, maybe we would work if we took some of that pressure off. So like maybe he would like be the donor and we would decide along the way if we were a couple or if we were just like kind of platonically co-parenting um, that had its complications. Yeah. It, ultimately I just decided there were so many reasons why it made sense to do it on my own. And I just didn't want to muddy the waters, which meant I had to go, if I wanted it to happen anytime soon, I had to go with one of the major banks. It sounds like you really have to know yourself to go through this You do because what yeah. you just said about a friend <laughs> I would have thought of a million reasons why going to a friend might be challenging, but the resentment part didn't even occur to me. You know, cause I remember mm-hmm. when I was like thinking about these things too, I had a friend that's, um, he's gay and he doesn't want like ch- children of his own, but he was like, yes, like I would totally do it for a really good friend of mine. And there's the complication of like, you know, your kids seeing their dad, but not knowing it's their dad. And like, how do you, will it affect the friendship? Yeah. Will I get weird and not want to be around him? Like, there's so much to think about in doing it with someone you know, which sounds comforting to a lot of people. Like you said, sometimes it's better to just kind of like do it independ- right. completely independently. Right. Yeah. Because even though you're not in a romantic relationship with that person, it still is a relationship. And you, just like any relationship, you will have expectations, whether you've named them or not, um, about what it means for that person to be your donor or to be the biological parent to your yeah. child. And you have to be willing and ready to kind of renegotiate that over and over and over throughout your child's life yes. because you don't know how you're going to feel if that person does want to come to your kid's first, fifth, fifth birthday party and you don't want them there or you want them there and they don't want to come or, you know, I mean, yes. just like, what about his mom? Like, does his mom think that she's the grandma? Or do you want right. her to think she's the grandma? Like just so many complications. True. I think there are massive benefits as well. And especially for the child to like, be able to know and see and name their roots and their, that identity piece. Um, but there's not a lot of legal protections. Mm. There's just a lot of gray area. And Mm. I think for many of us, when we feel in a hurry, it Mm. just feels safer to go with a sperm bank. Yeah. Which has its issues as well. Like Um, what? Many of them. Well, like my son has roughly, um, I don't even know the number, but I would guess 70 half siblings. Um, somewhere around there. And I just don't think that that's good for anyone mm. um, because we are in touch with his donor, which was not something that was offered through the bank, but he, mm. there's like an internal message board. That's part of the sperm bank offering that is like anonymous, but you can kind of communicate with other people who are in your pod, which would be the donor if he wants to participate and then families who have used the same donor. And it's meant to connect over like if there are any medical concerns or, you know, just kind of general developmental type things. Right. Um, so our donor was made it known that he was open to communication as much or as little, to- totally left it on the side of the receiving family. So we're in touch with the donor And he is a lovely person. Um, I have just been like really impressed with the way he conducts himself and his level of respect for the various like desires of different receiving families. And if he wanted to, which I think he's certainly open to um, developing relationships at whatever level of comfort each family is interested in, that's way too many kids. 
Like he can't, he can't travel to that many places or meet that many families or maintain any level of connection with that many families. And it goes, it's the same across with the, with the donor siblings that, um, you know, if they, like my son is not going to be able to be close to all of his siblings. He may, that may not matter to him at all, but if it does matter, I'm sad that it's not 15, 20, you know, like a number that's manageable. So this actually brings up a really good question about like what you have told or plan to tell your son about this experience. Obviously you're very public about it. So like, there's not gonna be any secrets, but you you will leave it open for him. If he wants to meet the, his, this is absolutely. ah. In fact, he has met, he has, he hasn't met his donor, but he, we have FaceTimed with his donor, but he's met some of his donor siblings. Wow. Um, and we, they came to visit us and we had a little kind of weekend and I live in Austin. So they came and and we did like, you know, fun Austin stuff. Well, what, what you can do with toddlers in tow, right? In Austin. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely open. What I tell him is, um, we have a little board book that I created that is photos of the don- many of the donor siblings. It's not all of them, but the ones that wanted to participate in this book. Um, one of the moms created it on one of the places, you know, online where you can order, make, you know, make little board books. And then all of us that wanted it, like placed an order and got our own copy. And so it just has all of the the kids in there in alphabetical order, it's their photo on one side and their name on the other. And so it's just a board book full of faces and names. And then on the very last page is a picture of our donor and his name. And so when we get to that page, when we're looking at this book, I, t- I tell my son, um, you know, to make a baby, you need three parts. You need an egg from a, from a woman, you know, and, and you need the sperm and then you need a belly to carry the babies. And so mommy had an egg and a belly that could carry babies. Um, but I didn't have the sperm. And so this is the guy that, that helped us. He gave us the sperm. And so I use the word sperm with my two-year-old and, you know, I'm just hoping he doesn't use it on the playground, but if he does, I just feel like that's yeah, an opportunity, yeah, right? Scientific, yeah. Like, right. <laughs> right. And so what I've started to tell him is, you know, so-and-so, cause he recognizes some of the faces and we FaceTime with some of the, the donor siblings, you know, so-and-so, um, so-and-so's mommy used the same sperm as the same sperm donor. So I'm using the the actual terms with him because I don't want him to be confused. I know a lot of women say things like helper and that would totally be appropriate too. Mommy needed a helper um, and then later kind of bring in the idea of sperm. But to me, it just made sense to kind of explain the the technical aspects of it that, you know, egg, belly, sperm, the doctor helped put the egg and sperm in mommy's belly. Yeah. Can I ask you a question now? I'm going to ask from the perspective of like a, someone completely in, ignorant, right? Someone who's watching this and has like a million questions. Sure. So is one of the reasons that you mentioned that it's not ideal that there's so many half siblings, obviously, because he can't have a relationship with all of them. But is there also this question of like, what if he meets one of them? I mean, what are the chances are and doesn't realize as a sibling? Like, is this a thing yes. that, yeah. You know, <laughs> every, everybody brings that up. It's so funny. I don't know where that comes from, but I think the odds are so incredibly low. Um, I think most of our donor siblings are elsewhere in the world, but that yeah. is a reason why, because it's not local. It's, you know, we have half siblings in Canada okay. and Spain, you know, all oh. over the place. But I think that um, it's one of the reasons why I am talking to him about it now, because I think that, you know, eventually when he's dating and things like that, it would be something to, to bring up like, Hey, you might just want to make sure this, you know, girl yeah. or guy you're interested in, like whatever that they're pretty sure their biological parents are actually their biological parents. Yeah. Or if they know that they're donor conceived, like maybe we ought to compare numbers. Yeah. Um, but no, it's not something I worry about. Okay, good. It's like so small down the, yeah, but I, I mean, mean, I think, yeah. no, but I like your one openness. Of, helps. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. 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 No, I was just going to say like one of the other things that people do bring up that I think is more of a concern is like, what about, um, like unknown or undisclosed health issues that could have been passed on to your child. So that's one reason why I'm so grateful to our donor for being willing to be open. Cause if I ever have any questions, it's very easy to just text him and, you know, ask like, Hey, is this something that runs in your family? That's another reason why many women are drawn, especially, you know, women who are in their forties or close to are drawn to younger donors. And most donors are quite young. They're, they're typically in their early to mid twenties. Um, I actually chose a donor who was closer to my own age. He's two years younger than me. So he's 40 right now. I'm 42. And part of my thought process with that is that number one, I felt like his consent meant more to me choosing to be a donor because he was in his thirties. He'd lived some life. Like I just Mm -hmm. felt kind of weird about using a 20 year old sperm because Mm -hmm. did he really understand Mm -hmm. what he was agreeing to? But, but also um, all of the health implications, like he's older, which means his parents are older, his grandparents are older, and some wow. of those health things have come up 
that maybe hadn't come up. I mean, some of these 20 year old donors, it's like, oh, they're, you know, their parents, there's no cancer or anything in their family. I'm like, right. Cause their parents are my, not age. yet. Right. Like, <laughs> right. Right. So like in 10 years there, there will be right. So they look like they have a cleaner bill of health and actually they're just younger. You thought of some really amazing questions that I don't think I would have realized. <laughs> like you're, it's such well, a good I spent like a year kind of getting, you know, wrapping this is why I also did coaching services can really go a long way to help a lot of women. Thank because you. I you hope so. Really thought about a lot of things. Back well, to- and I also chose three different donors. This was the donor that I landed with was actually the third donor that I chose. In the beginning, I was like, I think I should probably choose someone who has features similar to mine because like I wanted my child to look in the mirror and like feel like he looked like his family. I didn't want him to wonder, you know, where like where did I get this nose or these eyes or whatever? Um, so I ended up choosing someone ultimately that doesn't look a whole lot like me or my family, um, but looked more like someone I would actually be attracted to. It was very weird for me. The first couple of um, donors like totally could have passed as my brother, but I would never have like been interested in dating them, you know? Interesting. Um, and it just felt more natural to choose someone that I would naturally be really like right. attracted to. Yeah. Um, and my son looks so much like me and my dad and I, I don't know how that happened, but <laughs> you, know, you just never know what the genetics are going to do, right? This is, so. Okay. Another question. Let's go back again to your journey. How did your family and your support system react and treat you throughout this whole process? So I feel very lucky that my family was very supportive. Yeah. I think I'm also very much a verbal processor and an oversharer. So mm-hmm. there was never a moment where it was like breaking the news. Hey guys, I'm, I think I'm going to do this crazy thing. And they went from like not knowing to knowing mm. it was more like me kind of like, I think I might actually consider, you know, what would happen? Do you think I could actually, you know, all of these kind of wonderings for so long that I think when I finally decided to do it, everybody was like, yeah, that makes total sense. You've been talking about that forever. Mm. Um, but also there was that period of time where I was doing it and I wasn't ready. And that was a struggle because I was so in such a fragile place and Mm. to have my family kind of echoing back, like, are you sure about this? And I wasn't sure about it. Like that was hard, but I'm glad that I was talking to people. I was talking to friends. I was talking to family. Um, I was talking to a therapist. It all happened in the, like, the midst of COVID when we were in like complete lockdown, not even seeing family. So I, I was to a certain extent pretty isolated, which I think is where I started the podcast and um, kind of tried to create some community around it because I wasn't out in the world as much as, you know, I would have been without COVID. Yeah. And then what about work? So I know that another thing that women are afraid of, even just increasing eggs, before, you know, before we even get to the next level is right, right, right. how do I take time off of work to do the injection? Well, you do the injections at home, but right. to go do the scans, all, and the, all, appointments the, all the appointments, and, yeah. how do you manage that? How much do you tell your office or your work? Like, right. how do you manage yeah. that? I was really fortunate that I had a wonderful boss at the time. I have a wonderful boss now. It's just a different boss, but, um, I told my boss what was going on, but she's also a very, still is a very close friend. And so I felt comfortable. She's someone I would have told whether or not she was my boss just because of our friendship. Um, so I was very lucky that I was able to kind of make those appointments work and flex my calendar. And, and it wasn't a huge issue. It was also COVID. So we were home hmm. working from home. Hmm. It just, there was a little bit more flexibility. Right. You weren't like running out every day. People were like, where's she going? Yeah. Yeah. So that, that was fine. And then like telling people at work that I was pregnant as a solo parent, I had so much anxiety around sure. about that. I, it was no problem at all to tell my immediate team, which is about like 10 people or so that I know fairly well. And I knew they knew me and I think they like, I knew they were going to be happy for me and that it would make sense to them. And also that they believed that I could handle it, like that they weren't going to be like, Oh my God, you know? Um, it was more telling, so I, I work, I train and and lead a large, large team, like over a hundred people. And I told them on zoom while we were still all at home, cause I was about to go out on maternity leave and hadn't said anything yet. Wow. And I was so terrified to tell all of these people that I had done this. Cause I knew they all knew, or at least in my mind, they all knew I was single and they all like were tracking my personal life. I think half of them probably didn't even realize that I was single. I did say I decided to do this on my own and I used a donor. Like I made that very clear, but even that was all when we were still home COVID, you know, a couple of years ago. And even still some, some people will be like, are you and your family doing blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I know they're picturing me with a, like they've forgotten. 
It was like such a big <laughs> announcement for me. And they've literally, they know I have a toddler and they forget that I'm doing it by myself. And I'll like remind people sometimes. Oh yeah, no, I don't actually have, it's just me and my toddler. Like that's it. <laughs> it's a reminder to us that like, we think everyone's watching us so closely. Yeah. You know, you're so nervous yeah. to do they any big care. decision. No one cares. Right. Right. Yeah. The other thing I will say, cause this is something that comes up a lot in my coaching is women bring the thought they are going to think that I'm not going to be as focused or as dedicated or like as on at work, like they being the boss or the team or whoever, that's the thing that they want me to coach them on. And they want, I know they want the answer to be like, no, they're not. They're, they're going to, you know, mm-hmm. see how hard you're working. But, and really where I usually land with that is like, do you think you're going to be as focused at work? Like, do you think you're going to bring as much like of your whole self to work as you're doing right now as a single woman with no partner? Cause I actually don't think you will. And I think that's okay Mm. because most of us who are in this demographic of women who are choosing solo motherhood, believe in ourselves enough to, to believe that we can handle it are not settling for some dude from Bumble just to like make this happen at the last minute. right? Right. We are killing it at work. And you could bring 75% of what you're bringing today and still be killing it at work. Right. You know what I mean? So like, what if your productivity does go down a little bit at work? And what if like your work is not your whole life, but you got to be a mom? Like, isn't that a worthwhile trait? Like, what if we're just not as good at work? Listen, I love the way you're talking about how beautiful motherhood is. And just what you just said about you still got to be a mom and it's a really big deal. Because I think that like a lot of the rhetoric now is very much like whatever. And everyone Mm -hmm. is entitled to live their life however they want, of course. And I support Mm -hmm. it. But I want to make sure that there the women who out there who still really want this don't feel like they're not like, I don't know what the word is. I want to say feminist. Like you're not, it's okay to think that it's not enough to just be like amazing at career and to still want a family and to still do put everything you want into making it happen. It's okay. You know, Ugh, it's the best. I yeah. I can't imagine missing it. I, ca- I can't. I mean, if you know that it's what you want, right. there's, it's, there's just nothing better. And right. I don't think every woman wants it the way right. that I do. Right. But if you, if it's, if, if it's calling you, then you got to go for it. I mean, it, it is worth everything. And like you said, you can freeze the embryos and you don't have to use them. But you've put something yeah. away to take the pressure off of yourself, take the pressure off of yes. dating, and sort of like calm your mind a little bit. It's expensive, yes. but it's a choice. Yes. It's an option for you later. Right. I think that's right. And huge. it gives you, depending on the outcome, it gives you so much flexibility moving forward. Um, you know, I'm planning to have a second child. I thought I would be pregnant with my second child by now. And I opted to push that by a year, which means that I will be 43, close to 44 if, if everything goes as planned when I deliver that second child. And did I ever think I would be having babies in my mid forties? Absolutely not. But it makes so much more sense for me career wise, financially with my son, with my coaching, like all of that. And I get to push that off because of all of the preparation that I did. Absolutely. And and saving exactly earlier. (laughs) Really quick um, question. I know that everyone is also wondering about this, what you said about when you started the IUIs and you were like, wait, I can't have a kid right now. That's something that everybody feels. I felt even when we got married early, like it was just all too happening too fast. But um, to when you finally did it and even being in a better financial place, like how do you, how should one think of the financial planning for something like this? Not just the, the process, but even the after the math, you probably need to get a nanny. You need, there's so much financial investment that goes into it for someone doing it on their own as well. So how can right. you, what do you tell women about that part? So I think my answer now is very different than it would have been at all of those steps along the way. And when I actually made the decision, I will say, um, I think it's really sweet that when I, when I'm coaching women, they'll say things like, um, well, I am like very last minute and disorganized right now, but I know that when I'm a mom, I'll have to be like really on top of things. I'm like, "Mm, you're probably going to be really disorganized and last minute and also have a kid at the same time because you're not going to be a different person. Right. And so if you're a saver now, you'll keep figuring out a way to save, even when your expenses increase, if you're kind of like paycheck to paycheck now, you'll somehow figure out like, you're not going to be a different human. Right. Right. You're just yourself, but with a kid. Right. And those those expenses, they kind of like, like I don't do the $120 gym membership 
and I probably spend that in like diapers and whatever, you know, and like it all just kind of balances out. Right. I don't feel that it's like other than daycare, I don't feel like it's crazy expensive to to have a child. Yeah. you know, it's different. It's give and take. Like there are things that I just don't do anymore, but I, right. it's not even because of the money. It's because I just don't have the time. Right. There are no brunches with friends. There's right. no yoga studio membership. You right. know, those things just don't happen. Um, so I think that, um, what has been the most helpful for me is rather than trying to control or manage the logistics, like, of course we have to plan and we have to think through things, but to get obsessed with like trying to solve problems that haven't happened yet mm. is just like setting yourself up for a lot of like, unnecessary anxiety. And so what's helped me the most is to really ground myself in identity and to, to know myself, like to do the work and the personal development work and, and to like know who I am as a mom, as a person. And so things like, I always figure it out. Like, I know that to be true. I can name a hundred examples of how I've figured it out. Was it easy? No. Did it take multiple tries? Maybe, you know, but I always figure it out. Another thing I tell myself all the time is I'm a good mom who has lots of resources. And like, I get even a little choked up to say that because when I'm telling myself it's a good mom, I'm a good mom. It's in the moment when I feel like the worst mom, mm. but I just can take that deep breath and remind myself, no, you're a good mom and you have lots of resources. Mm -hmm. So you can, whether that's financial, whether that's that Instagram account that's posting these parenting tips that are just what you need in that moment, yeah. you just have to kind of take that moment and tell yourself what you know to be true. And the other thing that I love to tell myself is like, be where your feet are. Like today, right now, I've got my bills covered. Today, right now, my child is doing okay. Today, you know, like instead of going way into the future or mm -hmm. the past of what I could have done differently, or mm -hmm. I could have saved this, or I could have mm -hmm. shouldn't have bought that, mm -hmm. or you know, but just being where you are right now yes. is I mean, it's the cheesiest thing, no, but it's so it's true. so profound. Like, <laughs> no, you're right. I shouldn't have gone on that holiday. I should have put that money towards that. You're right. We do that all the time. And then like, how am I going to pay for college one day? Like you can really get ahead of yourself and talk yeah. yourself out of this. And like totally. you said, you always make it work and remember that yeah. and believe it. Wow. Yeah. So in terms of like, everyone always says like, it takes a village, right? And we know it's true, but obviously not everybody has a village. How do you yeah. create that community for yourself and that village, so to say, to help. I love that question so much. Yeah. <laughs> like literally moments before we hopped on this, um, this video, I just posted a reel about that on my Instagram. Um, and what I, what I wanted women to know, because many of the women who follow me are, are considering or pursuing solo motherhood, but aren't there yet. And what I wanted women to hear is that it's okay. If you don't have a village right now, the majority of my village are people I didn't know mm. when I was thinking and planning and pregnant. And even in the first year of my son's life, they're people that I've collected along the way. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that part of it is again, like rooting yourself in that identity. It, it's a fine line between, I never want to like, like crumble into this, like, Oh, woe is me. I'm a single mom. Like, no, I I'm a good mom with lots of resources and I can't do everything yeah. like that can both be true. Like I need help and I can offer help. Like mm. I'm strong and I can't do it all. You know, right. all of that can be true. And so for me, help has looked like um, paying for help, mm -hmm. which is, you know, I wish I didn't spend as much as I do in babysitters, but also I love to pay them because <laughs> it is such a clean, energetic exchange. What I mean by that is when I, I ask for my family's help, I'm like, oh gosh, they're probably wondering where I am. I need to rush back. Whereas like my babysitter, I'm paying her till this time. Uh -huh. So I'm, and she's I'll a sit professional. in my driveway and scroll. Yeah. I'll sit in my driveway and scroll my phone until the, <laughs> until the minute I'm done paying her and then walk through the door then. Right. <laughs> I love a professional. I love it. Right, right. Right. And so that is worthwhile. The other thing that I've done is I've really made an effort to create community of other single mothers by choice locally wow. and across the world, but especially my local connections. For me, it started with, Hey, I have an idea. This was around a year old, like not with an infant, but like when, when the kids are getting a little bit more independent, I chose another mom who I clicked with. I did not know her well. We had never hung out outside of like a group setting, but her kids were about the same age and, and I liked her and I trusted her. And I said, Hey, I would like to find someone who'd like to partner with me in a childcare exchange. What I'm looking for is could be Saturday, could be Sunday. I'm looking for maybe like three hours in the morning before nap time, you know, like, you know, with kids, you're up at 
5 a.m. Like it's ridiculous, <laughs> right? So you, yeah. you can start early. But I'm like, I'd love to, I'd love to start. Would you be comfortable or willing to drop your son off at my house sometime this weekend? I'll keep him for a couple hours. We'll see how that goes. And then it'll be your turn. And we've done that now for over a year. It is the best love. thing because I, when she drops her son off, I am like, go take your time. Don't tell us when you're coming back. Like mm. go enjoy. Cause I know what a gift that is. And then I know because it's so balanced that like, she is the person that I call when it's a last minute, like, Hey, I know it's not actually my turn, but like, can we, could, is there any way like last weekend I bought my son this yard, this big plastic, like yard toy thing. Yeah off of marketplace and I went to go pick it up and it didn't fit in my car with the car seat in the car. So I had this whole situation where I'm like, where do I, there's no, I don't, I can't do this by myself. So I called her and was like, Hey, can I swing by your house, leave my kid and, and his car seat at your house for like 20 minutes while I go get this piece and then come back. And she's like, sure. Yeah. We're just hanging out. But to like have somebody that you can ask, like, I think it starts with like, being willing to give as well as receive. And I never want to be like the woe is me. I'm a single mom. I need all the help because I have a lot to offer as well. Right. And then it just feels better. To and be it able must, to- and also doing it by choice is so empowering that I don't know, like, I, I can't speak for you, but you probably don't even allow yourself to feel woe is me because you must feel just so like I'm doing what I've always wanted to do. And I did it on my own terms. And, you know, yeah. I yeah. feel like even at the hardest moments, yeah. I mean, I think so we beautiful. all can default into what was me. I think that that's like a very natural thing. Sure. But what I like to tell myself when I'm in that situation is like the resistance or the, like the, those thoughts about what was me are just making it worse. And so mm-hmm. like something that I say often in my coaching is the only thing that's worse than being up all night with a crying baby is being up all night with a crying baby that you believe shouldn't be crying. <laughs> Like when you're resisting the reality, right? So like we've had those moments where he's sick and I'm sick and I'm out of days at work. So it's costing me to stay home and that, you know, and we all feel like shit. And to then add the layer of this shouldn't be happening or woe is me that I don't have a partner who can take a shift or whatever. Like that's just making it work. It doesn't, or worse, it doesn't matter if it's true or not. It's not helpful. Yeah. So I just try to not go there. Right. It's, no, that's really a nice thing to hear because that was literally last night. My daughter just screaming her head off in the middle of the night. And yes, and I do default to everybody gets to sleep except me. Everyone else's kid is sleeping through the yeah. night except mine. <laughs> Why? And, and you're, it doesn't help. It just like adds like this extra yeah. layer of like tension that is like not productive. So I think right. it's a good so I do for feel like, I feel like I get to skip that a little bit. Like, I think people automatically think about the hard parts of being a solo mom, but honestly, I think that's one of the biggest advantages is how little energy I give to like weighing fairness or whose role it is or whose turn it is. Like there's none of that in my house because it's all me. Yeah. And to me, that's just like such a good trade-off because it takes so much emotional energy to maintain a relationship with a partner Yeah. that I'm just not spending yeah. that energy. So I get to spend that elsewhere, right? Managing my own thoughts really is where that goes. It's like <laughs> to taking care of the woe is me thoughts, right? But just in my own mind instead of about someone else. All right. Well, uh, well, but well. I love it. I love parenting alone. How is dating now? Non-existent, <laughs> <laughs> um, which is like such a shocker to me. Um, because I thought that I was doing this to kind of take the pressure off and then I'd get right back out there. I think I did so much dating before I made this decision that I'm like still kind of experiencing the, the like burnout and fatigue that just getting back back on the apps. I'm like, Oh God, am I really doing this? But I think the main thing for me is not even like, I think that if I weren't working full time and running a business that has been really like picked up, I think I probably would be interested in dating. The way I think about it is like, by definition, a priority, you can only have a few priorities, right? right? Like otherwise they're not priorities. And so I think of like, if I have this list of priorities, dating is on there. It's just right now it's like falling below the line of like things that I could reasonably manage. So I'm just not doing it because can I find time to go get drinks with a guy, sure. But then what if it goes well? Like I'm going to have to find that time again and again. And you know, cause you just tried to schedule with me and I was like, I literally don't know when I can talk to you. Yeah. Um, so it's just not something I'm making time for right now. Um, you know, I, it's just not on my radar. And that is shocking because I, I made it mean so much about me that I hadn't met a partner. And now I, it's just, 
it's neither here nor there. Like yeah. there are wonderful things about partnership, but like, I also really want to landscape my backyard and I'm not doing that either. <laughs> like there are lots of things I want to do in life that like I just can't do right now. Right. Like sense. it'll, it'll come or it won't, but like right now I don't feel that I'm missing it. Yeah. I think one of the main driving forces, I think the number one thing is time. I just don't know when I would date. But the other thing is I really want to have a second child. And now that I've kind of identified the upsides of doing it this way, I don't want to complicate things by meeting someone in the meantime. I feel like it would delay. Right. I'm like right back in that same place. If I met someone this weekend, I'm not going to be ready by next summer, which is my timeline for having a second child or getting pregnant again. I don't want to get pregnant with someone else's baby next summer, but I do want to get pregnant next summer. So I need to not meet the guy until I'm on the other side of that. I know this is a really hard question because there's so many, but can you think of like what has been the best moment of motherhood so far or one you can recall on the spot? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just got emotional just like even thinking about it. I mean, of course it's like, it's all the moments that all moms experience that are just so sweet. But I think there are these moments, like the one that comes to mind is the first time we made it through the airport, just the two of us with like the the (sighs) diaper bag and the stroller and like all the things. And we got to the gate and I was like, we We nailed it. it. (laughs) Like we did it, you know? Yeah. Um, Just the sense of like, togetherness Uh and it's just the two of us. And I love it so much. I think, um, I've noticed that when I'm around other adults, of course I'm talking to the other adults and I'm attending to my child if he asks for something or has an obvious need, but I'm not tuned into him in the same way that I am when it's just the two of us in the house. And you probably notice this as well in your home, like when your partner's there versus when your partner's not there, I think children get talked over quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And that's just kind of their experience. It happened to us as well. It's just like the nature of things. But I love that. Like I have so much more connection with my son that I actually believe there's a huge benefit for him developmentally to have a solo parent because it is just the two of us. So he's 50% of the family. Yeah. You know, and he's not the one. It's all of your energy when you're home. Mm. He does. Yeah. Yeah. I feel the same about being a working parent. I always thought I would prefer to be a stay at home mom, but now I'm like, I'm so glad that our time together is like finite and kind of determined by what time we get home and what time bedtime is because I know to pay so much more attention because that time is like so confined versus like us just being together all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I think that like my kids go to daycare three times a week now and the two days that I have them are always like that much more wonderful yes because you yes. have them otherwise i agree with you yeah and then last question um what is maybe like the one piece of advice that you would give to someone watching this that is wants to do it and it just needs a little bit of a push or encouragement or whatever you think she oh might gosh need. okay can i can i say three things <laughs> yes <please. laughs> um, okay the first thing i'll be fast but well, the first know. thing would be like go and get your fertility checked like go that's like just the first logistical piece is like, go get your numbers. Don't pay attention to statistics. Doesn't matter what was possible. doesn't matter when your mom or your grandma had you or whatever. <laughs> like, people say all kinds of different right. things. It doesn't mean anything unless it is your own medical record. So like, go get your fertility check. Just find out where you, where you're starting and, get, you know, ask questions. I think that's number one. Um, number two, I think is any kind of personal development work that you can do, whether it's therapy or coaching or books or podcasts or, you know, whatever you can do um, that resonates with you, that is improving your ability to manage your own mind. I think like the vast majority of our suffering and our struggle happens like in our own brain. And there are so many tools out there um, to help you kind of get to a place where you're just not suffering you're not causing your own suffering. Right. right? Um, so I just think that that is like the best parenting tip I can give is like, if you work on your own shit now, so that when it's you and an infant or you and a toddler, like you're not like, yeah, they're the, they're the ones having the meltdowns, not you, right? (laughs) you know? Um, so I think that that's really valuable. And then the last thing I would say is community, like just getting plugged in with the community of other women doing this, Mm. because I, for me, I, my biggest kind of roadblock, I got to a place where I could see that I could feasibly do this and maybe even that I would thrive. Like I might even like doing this better than doing it with a partner. My hang up was what the world was going to think about it. Right. I made it mean all kinds of things about my value and my attractiveness and right. my ability to get a man, keep a man, whatever. Right. Um, 
And so I had a lot of stories about myself. And then I'd met, I met like one or two women who I'm like, oh my gosh, she's got this incredible career. Oh, she's gorgeous. She's hilarious. She's like, you know, just has her stuff together. And you can't think of that as like an outlier when it's like literally the, the community, that. like it's the most incredible community. So then it just felt like there was this like cognitive dissonance. Like I couldn't feel poorly about myself when I started to see the community that I was a part of. Yeah, And it just like clicked for me. Oh, these are the women that didn't settle. Like there are I women out there that way. who met their partners and they were, and it was right. And that was like true. And that was what was, should, should happen for them. And then there are the women who lower the bar just so mm -hmm. they don't end up alone. Right. And then there are the women out there. Woe is me and not willing to do anything about it. Right. And we are the ones who like unfortunate circumstances or not, like we didn't meet the guy and we're moving forward anyway. And it takes a very, like, a badass to do that. You I know agree. what I mean? Like it takes a very different type of woman to even consider that. And so in the community, I think it's just, you're just blown away yeah. by the caliber of women. And so I think that that's the number one thing. And that's really behind all that I do. And, and we didn't talk about the work that I'm doing, but I run retreats and groups, coaching groups, and um, provide resources for women who are on the path to solo motherhood. And it's exactly for that purpose, to help women feel less alone, um, to know that not only are you not the only one thinking about these things or, or considering doing this, um, but the women who are doing it are, are just such incredible resources and such incredible supports. And you don't have to walk alone through this. I 100% believe that I have more support than most of my coupled friends because of the community be, that I Absolutely. Felt. And you have to be deliberate yeah. about finding that support. Probably you don't take right. it for granted. Oh my right. God. I can't think right. of a better place to end. Thank you so much for meeting with me today yeah, and sharing so your welcome. story and being candid. Um, I'm sure that you help so many people in your work. I think that even just getting your message out there will help even more women. Um, again, thank you, Katie Ryan. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing the message. I appreciate it. Single greatest choice dot com yeah. <laughs> podcasts instagram it. accounts everything yes. it was yes. a pleasure all the single greatest choice thank you so much thank you again bye-bye all right bye